All right, good morning again. Welcome to worship here at Ascension. A very special welcome to guests and visitors who are with us, whether that's here in person or if you're joining us online. Thanks for being with us. We're excited that you're here because every time we gather here, we're all about Jesus and what Jesus has done for us and the forgiveness that Jesus has given us. Today we get to continue in this sermon and worship series, United. All about unity, all about being together. But I got to ask today, how united do you really want to be? Because what we're going to talk about today isn't like a low-level unity thing. It's like uh, we are so close with each other that when one of us makes a mistake, when one of us needs to get called out, we can be comfortable with other people doing that for us. That's the level of unity that God gives us in Jesus. I'm looking forward to sharing this message with you. Everything that you're going to need for worship, you can find printed up on the screen or on your screen at home. We good to go? We are awesome to go. Thank you, tech team. Awesome for getting this set going. Uh, we're going to kick off with our opening song, which is Speak, O Savior, I Am Listening. A big part of doing this, uh, encouraging each other, warning each other, and watching out for each other, is first listening to God, listening to what he has to say about everything, and then being able to apply it to our lives. stand. We begin our worship with words that remind us of what our Heavenly Father did for us when we're baptized. When he washed us clean of our sins, he made us his, part of his family, so when we hear his name, we know that's our name now too. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. But every time we gather together, we first have to admit that we haven't lived up to God's standard that we haven't done what we needed to do, that we've sinned and fallen short, that we need help. Holy God, gracious Father, 
Because I am a sinner, I don't deserve to be united with you. I haven't trusted you more than anything else. I let the things of this world get in the way of the unity in your church. I failed to help my brothers and sisters by not warning them about sin. I've been self-centered. I haven't thanked you for all the ways you bless your church through all of its members. I can rightly pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. But our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. In his better wisdom, he sent his son Jesus into this world and through Jesus' work. He reunites sinners like us with himself. Because of Jesus, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, you are united to God and to each other. Amen. Lord God, you have determined what is right and wrong. Continue to help us grow in your word so that we can know when we need to warn each other and then work repentance through your word so that we have the opportunity to forgive each other as Jesus calls us to do through your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We're continuing with this worship series that comes all from the book of 1 Corinthians. And today, this is kind of like a peak. This is a high point in the book. This is a huge point of tension because this is one of the reasons why the whole letter was written to these people. You see, they had issues. We've talked about issues with unity and divisions in the church. But more than that, they had issues with open sin. Clearly sin. And people were supporting and encouraging it. So what did Paul have to do? Warn them about what was going on. And what did he encourage them to do to warn each other? Because Christians are united in Christ, even these difficult conversations, these difficult things, we can do this in our lives too. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 5 now. This is what Paul says. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. And you are proud? Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who has been doing this? For my part, even though I am not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who has been doing this. So when you are assembled, and I am with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Every time we get to gather on Sunday mornings, we want to have something that will get the kids a little bit interested, excited, maybe thinking through and listening into the sermon. Today, kids, you get to sit back. You get to just listen, because this is more for parents. Anybody can answer. What I want to know, parents, is what's the difference between a tattletale and kids telling you something that they should tell you? All right? You kind of get what's going on here. Anybody can answer. What are some differences between tattletale and, all right, this is important. They need to speak up. What do you think? Who will share a thought? Tattletellers trying to make themselves look better than the other kids. Oh, kids, did you hear that? The one who's tattletaling is trying to make themselves look good and other people look not so good. Thanks, Diggs. Who else would like to share a thought? Okay. If a child is in immediate danger, then the tattletale, the tattleteller is justified. Okay, so if there's dangerous stuff going on, maybe then the one who's tattletaling Maybe that's okay. Yeah, it's a hard verb. I'm not sure what the right way to actually say it is. Yep, that would probably be a time where we would say, okay, that's okay. Other thoughts? It's a hard thing, you guys. That's why I'm looking out and you're all kind of going, well, I'm not really sure. Motivation for whatever their motivation for telling Ooh. is. 
That's awesome, Mickey. Motivation. What's the motivation going on in the heart of the one who's telling what's going on? That's a pretty big thing. One more thing, Scott. You got it? It's, it's also ensuring that your kids have the courage to come up to you and tell you something that's Ooh. of importance. Like if there's some the whole danger piece, whether it's an adult or a friend or something that's going on that they know is wrong and coming to us or an adult figure and saying, hey, I saw this or I know this is going to happen. That's awesome. Yeah, great thought of that takes some courage. To be able to say, hey, there's something wrong that's going on here, oh, that's a big deal. And I think, again, it goes back to motivation in a lot of ways. What we're going to talk about in the sermon, kids, is we're going to talk about times for us as Christians, as believers, that it kind of looks like tattletaling. It kind of looks like we're doing some stuff that I'm not sure if it's right, but where does it come from? A heart that's been motivated by Jesus. And Jesus' forgiveness for us. And that means sometimes we got to do a really hard thing, but God's going to give us the right motivation. And God's going to bless us as we do that. So listen carefully in the sermon. It's going to be a fun one today. Let's close with a prayer. Lord God, we thank you that you've given us our Savior, Jesus, who has forgiven us of our sins. We ask that you continue to grow our unity with each other so that as we do these kinds of things that you call us to do, you bless us. You keep us united, and you bring us closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Our next song is Lord of All Nations, Grant Me Grace. Let's start by all joining together and praying. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock, you are our redeemer. Amen. I love you. Those three words, when they get put together, are some of the best words in the English language, aren't they? This is what you want your kids to know as they're drifting off to sleep. Before you close the door and before you say goodnight one last time, what do you say? I love you. 
In any romantic relationship, these three words change the dynamic. There's uh, before the I love you in the relationship and the after I love you. Saying and hearing I love you in that kind of relationship sends you down a pretty awesome path. I love you is what you say to your mom or your dad or anybody that you love before they go on the training mission or the tour because you want these words to be echoing through their heads through all the challenges and all the struggles and all the difficult things that they're going to be facing so that they've got one constant truth that they can lean back on in all those times. I love you. So before the months or weeks, or years, or whatever it is apart, what do you say? I love you. If you can count up all the times that you say this, or you hear this in a day, no matter what that number is for you, I bet you like it if it was more. Even if showing isn't emotion, your kind of thing, I think you agree that this is still good. Because when you slow down and you take the time to listen and think through and understand, these three words can mean everything. Isn't it cool that God gave us a language where we can take a, just a few tiny words and string them together, and this can mean so much. Well, today I get to challenge you to think through another three-word combination and I want you to decide if that new three-word combination is even better than I love you. Because these three words that are new, these are words that you want your kids to hear from you often. These are words that are going to change the dynamic in a relationship, romantic or not any relationship. These words have ended hours or weeks or years of separation and brought people back together. Later on, I want you to have a real conversation with somebody, with anybody about this. What three words do you think are better? I love you or I forgive you. But before you get there, when you do this later today, before that, you got to hear what God said to this group of Christians who are in the city of Corinth about 2,000 years ago. And really, this part of 1 Corinthians, I think, should kind of come with a warning attached to it. If you didn't already feel it the first time as we read through these words, this little section, this is going to push you outside your comfort zone. You are going to want to ignore it. You're going to want to look away and pretend like you don't have to think about it. Most of this chat and this back and forth that we get to see challenges you. But after two weeks of focusing on how the cross and Jesus is the center and foundation of Christianity, now you're ready for this chat today. So let's break through that barrier. Let's talk for real. Here's where Paul starts. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that even pagans do not tolerate. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. Whoa. The messiness of saying I love you begins here. And even if you don't quite share Christian morals yet or today, I mean, this doesn't look good. God's messenger has to start by bringing the issue out into the open. And just with a couple words, you can feel the tension is starting to build. Ready for another layer of issues going on in this interaction? Paul has to say, and you, Christians, you're proud. Shouldn't you rather have gone into mourning and have put out of your fellowship the man who's been doing this? Not only is this an issue for the man, and his mother-in-law. Now it's messed with the whole group that was there. I mean, when you find out, what do you do? What do you say? Instead of dealing with it, this group turned out to be good with it. 
So good with it, in fact, that Paul, who is in a faraway, distant city where communication is hard, he's found out that they're so good with it that they're proud of it. The whole group now has issues with their morals, too. And here's what God's representative chose to do then. He faced it all head on. He didn't ignore or downplay these issues of morality. God's clear about all of this, so he's going to start by being clear too. For my part, even though I'm not physically present, I'm with you in spirit. As one who is present with you in this way, I have already passed judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus on the one who's been doing this. So when you're assembled and I'm with you in spirit, and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. At least I can say this is the height of the tension that we're going to hit today. And we got to make it clear, to hand over to the devil what he's talking about here doesn't mean to support or to go along with anything that the devil wants to be happening here. It means that they're simply supposed to see that by the actions of the two and the inactions of the entire group, that they were failing to help people understand that some in that group were on the path to hell. So, group of Christians, no more supporting, no more pride in what's going on. It's time to say it like it is. I think that there's one group of people, some of them are here today, there's definitely that group in our lives and in our world that are really, really great at doing that first kind of thing. They will call people out boldly. They will give some brutally honest truth and it will hit and it's just clear. Who's the best at this? Yeah, kids. Kids are just good at this kind of thing. I, uh, for the sermon, I read through a whole bunch of lists of brutally honest truths that kids have said to other people. I'm just going to share a few. There's a whole lot that I could have shared that were cringy and awful. So hopefully these aren't as bad as the other ones. But uh, here's the first one. At an aquarium, a uh, dad and a kid are there. And the kid looks up to his dad and he points at the fish and says, Wow, dad, that fish is even uglier than you. Ugh. Number two, a preschooler loves their preschool teacher. So they go and they hug their preschool teacher's little leg. And they say, Mrs. T, your leg is kind of squishy. You need to work out. What are you doing? Ugh. But maybe, maybe the worst one out of the three examples, number three, on the 35th birthday of a dad, a kid walks into their dad's room and at 5 a.m. whispers to them, oh, Happy birthday, Dad. Another day closer to death. <laughs> Whoa. I, I'm thankful that you're laughing. I'm thankful that there's some humor in here. But sense of humor aside for some of these funny things, uh, just reading and hearing these situations, reading them out loud, that makes you uncomfortable. Where you don't want to be there when these things are being said. You kind of want to separate from that. Because that puts you out of your comfort zone. At some point in this process of being united and encouraging one another, this is going to send you far outside your comfort zone. By nature, you and I are not built to be good at confrontation. I mean, you know how messed up you are. I know how messed up I am. And to confront somebody else about their issues, you feel like a hypocrite. You leave it to other people then and just hope that maybe somebody else, someday, they might be brave enough to talk about it and to deal with it. Doing what Paul does here, what God is encouraging us to do as a group, I think is one of the most challenging things for a Christian to ever do. And yet it's also what God calls us to do when he unites us on that firm foundation of Jesus. Christians need to watch out for other Christians. Now remember in context here, we're talking about Christians with Christians. That's a big piece of this. 
But every time that we see another believer who just ignores God's moral standards and lives against them, it's our responsibility to warn them. So whenever we do this and we stay inside our comfort zone and we never bring it up, it's like we're saying we really don't want unity, at least not the real unity that Jesus wants us to have. Every time we do this, we fail to be the brother and the sister, the Christian friend that that Christian person needs us to be. Thankfully for every way that we've failed to do this, there was one who was going to be exactly what people needed. You see, he was perfect with every person in every interaction. He called out people for their sins boldly and openly and at times gently and patiently. Then you got to hear words of forgiveness, sometimes that were boldly and openly spoken and then other times gently and patiently spoken. But whatever people needed, Jesus gave them. And what's amazing is that this kind of thing was never outside of his comfort zone. This was part of his mission, and Jesus stayed on task. When you get to read in the Bible about how Jesus did this, a big part of this you can see is Jesus was never trying to get people to live perfectly, to live up to that standard because he knew people weren't going to be able to do it. Instead, he was trying to lead them to understand God's morality and that they were people who needed his help. And all of that so that they might see that he had come to be the perfect one in their place who was going to give them forgiveness. A forgiveness that isn't a hope or a maybe or something that we have to work to get by doing better but a forgiveness that's here and now. A forgiveness that is real and impactful. A forgiveness that frees us from the burden of trying to live up to the standard of perfection. You'd figure in all of Christianity, of all the people that have ever been connected with Jesus, you would figure that the apostle and disciple Peter would have understood forgiveness. He'd been so close to Jesus for years. But then you understand and read a little bit more about Peter and you see how messed up he is. And how messed up we are sometimes too, like him. Not too long after Jesus ascends back into heaven, Peter starts making forgiveness look not like a gift that God gives freely, but more like something you have to do and earn. You see, he caved in to the peer pressure of people around him. He stayed in his comfort zone and he didn't confront people when they started making forgiveness about the outward things that you have to do. He started to live like it was Jesus and what Jesus did and you and what you do. So Peter got messed up. So imagine then being another Christian brother or sister and you have to call out Peter for his failure. How far outside your comfort zone would it be to challenge an apostle and a close friend of Jesus? I know I don't want to do this. But what's cool is that's not outside God's ability to work and to change Peter's heart. And it was the same messenger that God sent to the Christians in Corinth, the, the one who wrote this letter, who's also the one who goes to Peter who confronts him face to face, who calls him out for his sin and who helps Peter to admit that he was wrong. All of that leading to what did Paul get to say to Peter? What's the goal of all of this? What do we want to do in all these interactions? Paul got to say to Peter, I forgive you. What is going to push us outside of our comfort zones to do this hard thing? to realize that this is something that is bigger than you and me. It's what Paul did so many times. It's what drives us. Why should we do this and warn each other and call each other out for sin? 
so that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. It's all about keeping people connected to Jesus here and forever in heaven. That's why these words are beautiful. When you as Christians say these to other people, it's not just you saying these words. God's behind you as you say them. When you confront somebody with their sin and they repent, you had better say to them, I forgive you. God forgives you. You have this awesome responsibility of reminding them of who they are in Jesus. People forgiven by him. So this is where we're at in unity. Let's be intentional and let's start doing this. Let's say, I forgive you more in our lives. Think about all the ways and times that you say, I love you, and how impactful those words are. And then think through what the impact would be if you got to say, I forgive you as many times in a day. Think through how you'd be changed if people would say that to you every day. These three words are going to change life, too. And we can start by admitting, yes, this is something that is probably going to put you outside your comfort zone to start. But I know you're going to like where it ends up. Because saying these three words more with each other, with the people in our lives, this is going to make us into a group that can do some pretty awesome things. We're going to start to see each other as helpers. We won't get defensive. We won't let conversations spiral down and relationships spiral. We'll remember that God united us for each other. We'll live in his forgiveness that we get to share. If we do this more, what things can't we do together? What big challenges can't we face with each other? We'll be the kind of group that we want to be. A group that is all about getting people connected to Jesus and keep o- keeping people connected to him. So let's be who God has made us to be. Let's be united for each other. Amen. Please stand. In response to God's word and our Savior Jesus and what he calls us to do, let's confess our Christian faith. Let's say this is what we believe, words that are based on the Bible, words that are summarized in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we strive to kind of be the group that we want to be in the church that we want to be, we need your input. We need your influence. Uh, We would love for you to get connected to us. You can do that through our Church Center app. You can go to this website, uh, download it, get connected that way. There's opportunities for feedback. I would love to get your feedback about lots of things and to buy you coffee or lunch. Uh, Please do this. If you don't know how to do this, later on uh, as we head out, there's a welcome center table. Stop in. We'll get you signed up there. Uh, Please do this so that we've got the opportunity to know what you think our ministry should be and, and how we can do this. What we also get to do as Christians is we get to pool our resources to share Jesus with people. One of the ways we do that is financially. There's no obligation for anybody to give. God loves a cheerful giver. If you are moved to give, the offering plate is physically in back here, or you can give online. We'll take a minute to get connected.
if there's ever anything that we can pray for you as a group, please let me know. I'd love to include it uh, on Sunday mornings. At the end of each little petition in part, I'll say the words, Lord, in your mercy, and I invite you to join in and say, hear our prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for helping us to know our Savior Jesus has forgiven us and made us perfect and holy in your sight. Continue to strengthen us for all the ways that you call us to help each other through your word, through remembering our baptisms, through the Lord's Supper. Fill us so full that we're able to serve each other and get outside our comfort zones where we need to be. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Today especially, we get to thank you for the gift of earthly fathers, for the people that have raised us. Thank you for all the ways that you blessed us through these people, for physical, emotional, and all the ways that they supported us. We thank you for these gifts. We ask that you continue to shape our fathers, shape us to be people who are after your heart, people who know what you call us to do and to live in ways that you call us to live and to continue to support other people through us. Lord, in your mercy. God, we also ask that you help all those people who are in need. Help the people in our community who don't have what they need to live. Help us to see our opportunities to serve those people in our lives and together as a church. Bless us as we do this. Bless our work. And through these things, give us opportunities to share the good news of Jesus and the forgiveness that he won for them too. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God, you care about all people. We ask that you especially be with all those who are sick or suffering or recovering today. Bless their recovery. If it's your will, bring them back to full health. And through all of that, remind them that you are with them, that you love them, that they are forgiven. Lord, in your mercy. Hear us this morning, God, as we pray our private prayers. Hear us also as we join together and we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Uh, You may be seated for the closing song, May the Peace.
good morning again and happy Father's Day to all the dads and uh, thanks to everybody for the people who have raised us and supported us in our lives. Uh, I get to name drop. I think I've done this a couple weeks in a row. Cheryl and Vic, thanks for joining us online. I don't know anybody else's names who are for sure joining us online, but please get connected so that I can thank you for joining us. If you're ever able, we'd love to have you here in person. And for all of you who are here in person, thanks for being here. We're glad and excited that you're with us. We forget one of the ways that uh, God works and encourages us and builds unity is just by simply being together in the same place. So thank you. Your presence and your time here, it means a lot. A big thanks this morning, especially to our tech team, for having technical issues, for fixing them in about 10 minutes, and being able to share Jesus through that, too. Uh, Diggs and Michael, thank you guys for that. Uh, Michelle, always long. Yeah, we can clap for them. Will somebody clap for them? I don't know. That's why you're able to watch online right now, those guys. Uh, Michelle, too, for your far away, Audrey for music, all the ways that people come together and work to make this church is be what it is. Uh, big thanks. Uh, just a couple announcements. First thing, this is going to keep cycling for a long time, and I'm going to be intentional about it. This is good. If you ever think that you might need to talk to a professional counselor, uh, I've done this. Many other uh, members here are doing this. Please do this. This will be good. It will be a blessing for you. This costs you nothing. It's absolutely free. All you have to do is tell me you'd like to get connected. Uh, within about a week or two, you can have an online appointment where you can talk to somebody face-to-face -face on a computer or over the phone. This will be worth it. It will be good. Make use of this if you think you might be blessed. Uh, an awesome thing, uh, as we continue to shape who we are and who we want to be, is we're going to have this workshop called Everyone Outreach. This is what we want to be about, connecting people to Jesus, keeping people connected to Jesus. Uh, this is going to help us understand how we're going to do that. Maybe it's going to help us see how we think about doing these things and what our culture here is. This is super fun. I'm very, very excited for this. Friday, July 28th, we're going to have two hours. There'll be food around it. Then Saturday the 29th, uh, food, and then a good chunk of hours on Saturday too. This will be worth it. This is not coming and listening to one person talk. These are hours of interaction and input. And really, you're going to drive what this is. Uh, schedule this out. Mark this on your calendar. We're going to have uh, care for kids so that adults can be here who have kiddos, uh, food throughout the whole thing. But I promise you, after you leave at the end of this, you're going to say, this was worth it. Even though there's a lot of hours, it will be good. So that's coming up end of July. Yeah, one of the things that we prayed for were opportunities to help those in need. And one thing we want to try to do more here at Ascension is have kind of a nonprofit of the quarter, a mission uh, group that serves in our community to support them and encourage them and volunteer with them and help them. This quarter is, it's called CHU, Children Healthy Eating on the Weekends. Uh, we're going to have a lot of opportunities to serve. Some of the things we're going to do is a food drive just among us who are here. We're actually going to go out into different neighborhoods and kind of have food drives with neighborhoods and get feedback from neighborhoods then too. And if you ever want to volunteer, they are always looking for people to help put bags together to sort stuff. There's a house kind of down by the police station, courthouse area, that they're all about this. You need to go. Uh, it will be good. You'll be blessed. So look for details coming up on opportunities to serve, ways to get involved, because that's part of what we want to be as a church, is uh, a church that serves our community, too. Ooh. Yeah, I think the only other one that's on there. Well, yeah, prayer requests, certainly do that. Uh, if you're new here and you haven't ever gotten a mug or a gift card, Welcome Center, stop in. Mug and a gift card for an awesome coffee shop there. Uh, take an opportunity to chat. Get connected. Uh, I do know there is food today. Thank you to the Salvags for bringing food. So there'll be uh, 15, 20 minutes hangout time, chat time, food time, snack time. It'll be good. That's what Margo is waiting for is snack time. Uh, grab food, but then be intentional. I promise you there's people here that you don't know. I promise there's stories you haven't heard. Introduce yourself. Say hi get to know each other. That's kind of like a base level for unity that God has given us. After about 15 or 20 minutes, stick around, come back in here. We're going to keep going with kind of, I'm calling them brainstorming sessions. I don't know what we're going to call them, 
but opportunities for us to keep shaping this church, for us to actually uh, find some traction and to do some real things. Today, our conversation is going to center around what does our community want us to be as a church? Uh, it'll be worth it. It'll be good. Come. It's not a Bible study. It's just kind of planning, chat, and time. 15, 20 minutes back in here. We'll do that. I don't have any other announcements. We already got the thumbs up. God bless your weeks as you live for him.